Excellent. Nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to, nice see, to you. see you. Too. Okay. Wonderful. So Let I think Tatiana, you... we we can probably begin because we I know Mauricio started. has a long day ahead of him. That's fine. That's fine. We're good. That's fine. We're good. I'm I'm good till till ten ten thirty. Okay. We have about um, 88, 90 viewers now. So um, yes, let's begin by all means, okay. if you all agree. Sure, go ahead. Good afternoon to our viewers in Switzerland and good morning to the many of you joining us for today's webinar from the Americas. My name is Tatiana Gaspar. I'm the Managing Director of the Latin American Chamber of Commerce in Switzerland. The focus of our webinar will be on the important work of the IDB, the leading source of development financing in the region. We have over 250 viewers from the private and public sectors registered for today. They are little by little connecting as I speak. It is an honor to see that Swiss ambassadors from Chile, Ecuador and Panama, Costa Rica will join us as well as the ambassadors of Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Paraguay, and Uruguay here in Switzerland. A special welcome also to Alicia Barcena, Secretary General of the ECLAC. We are offering this webinar jointly with our partners, the Swiss Chambers of Commerce in Latin America, who have successfully mobilized their corporate communities. I would like to acknowledge the generosity of today's sponsor, Zürcher Kantonalbank. Since last fall, the IDB is under new leadership, which has numerous challenges on its agenda, some of them associated with the pandemic that are without precedent. The new president of the IDB was previously one of the principal advisors of the US president, on issues of national security and economic growth. Prior to that, he held different high-level positions at the IMF and the US Department of the Treasury. It is a great honor for me to welcome very warmly our guest, the president of the IDB, Mauricio Claver Carone. Wonderful to have you with us, sir. Thank you, thank you so much for the kind invitation. The moderator of this webinar is not new to our virtual activities. We had the pleasure last September to welcome him as a webinar speaker. He spent over half a century at Citigroup and is regarded as one of the experts on international banking and finance, having negotiated numerous debt restructuring contracts for countries around the world. His book, Banker to the World, Leadership Lessons from the Frontlines of Global Finance is a highly regarded must read and I'm proud to have my own signed copy. A very warm welcome, Bill Rhodes, and great to see you again. Thank you very much, Tatiana. I'm mm. delighted to welcome the president of our chamber, mm. Ramon Esteve, whose company, Eco Magro Industrial, has a long track record of cooperation with the IDB and who accepted to say a few introductory remarks. Good afternoon to you, Ramon. I will give you the virtual floor in just a moment. Before we begin, everybody, please be aware that we are recording this webinar. In the last part, there will be time for questions. If you wish to ask a question, please submit it in writing for us to pick up, preferably in the Q&A rather than in the chat. You can do this anonymously if you worry about privacy issues. Otherwise, I will say your name. Now I'm handing over to you, Ramon. Thank you very much, Tatiana, and greetings to everyone. It is also my pleasure to welcome our speakers and the wide audience we have uh, from our sister companies, uh, sister chambers, I mean, and uh, their guests. With some degree of optimism, I feel we are slowly transitioning to a post-pandemic world, but the situation will still be far from normal. We need to rebuild our economies, and for the Americas, IDB will be a very needed contributor. Facilitating the return, the return of a degree of prosperity is essential for stability on the continent. For the, for the past 15 years, I have been involved with development finance institutions such as IDB. 
Their focus has been shifting more and more towards the private sector, now recognized as an essential vector for development. Our involvement is due to my family's activity in trading agricultural commodities, primarily in the tropical belt. The IDB has contributed together with our partner organizations to improving the productivity and welfare of small farmers in Central America. Switzerland is a shareholder of ADB and a member of its governance bodies. It plays an active role within the bank. Our country's commitment to Latin America is based on strong historical ties that go back to the significant uh, Swiss immigration in the 19th century. Today, Swiss companies are very active on the continent with investments of more than $27 billion and providing jobs to more than 170,000 people. In terms of priorities, Swiss firms are aligned with IDB and support its 2025 vision, focusing among other things on digitalization, strengthening value chains, climate change mitigation, water, small and medium enterprises, and gender inclusion. Together with IDB, Swiss business will work towards several key objectives of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Swiss firms present in Latin America have much to offer. Our chambers and SGE can serve as relays. Swiss firms should also be interested to actively explore opportunities with IDB on the, on the continent as investors or as investees, developing new businesses in Latin America. As a chamber, we look forward to establishing a fruitful contact also with IDB's private arm, IDB Invest. We very much look forward to a successful achievement of these aims under your stewardship, Mr. Clever Caron, and a constructive contribution from these Swiss businesses. I would now like to hand the floor over to you for some opening remarks. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. And, and let me say, first of all, Bill, thank you. What a great pleasure to have you uh, as well as someone that I have followed. And I don't have a signed copy uh, of the book, but I, I will I will follow up because I indeed want one because it is it is. We, we will a, a remedy guide. that, Mauricio, very quickly. I love it because it's definitely a guide for me. And 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 I, I, I appreciated your leadership uh, over the years. Uh, and, and have learned so much. And Ramon, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And let me tell you, not only is the private sector key and has been growing in that regards in, the, in, in, in regards to the IDB, but it is a key to my administration is one of the, the legacies that I want to leave behind is that strength and role of the private sector, because it's going to be precisely at the heart uh, of the recovery. And Switzerland plays a particularly important role, not only as a shareholder in the group overall, but in IDB Invest. Uh, it is a leader uh, in that regards, in regards to our private sector engagement. Uh, and I welcome that. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here with all of you. And thank you, Diana. Thank you to the Swiss Chambers of Commerce in Latin America for all of the work you do. I'm really looking forward to this discussion, but, but before we get into the economics, I want to just take a real quick moment to give you kind of the full scope of what we're facing as a region, though I agree with Ramon that we are starting to see some light uh, at the end of the tunnel, although uh, uh, dim yeah. light. Uh, I know it's obviously not a surprise to you, uh, and obviously those joining us virtually that the pandemic has had a dramatic economic and health impact in Latin America and the Caribbean. And by the way, that was, that was highlighted recently uh, in the Swiss government's own report uh, on Latin America uh, in regards to its economic relations by the Secretary for Economic Affairs, which is a very good report. And, and as, as it shows, no community has been spared in the region. The region has about 8% of the world's population, but nearly 30% of all COVID-19 deaths. And obviously that percentage is rising, unfortunately. Despite all the painstaking efforts to stop the virus, the region uh, just reported its deadliest week uh, since the pandemic began. And so far, the region has reported a case fatality rate that's over 3.5 times higher than global average. That's over 875,000 deaths. Last month, we estimated here at the IDB that in 2020, Latin America and the Caribbean suffered its worst economic contraction in 200 years. Uh, the region's fiscal deficits rose from 
3 to 8% and public debt increased by nearly 25%. And it's because of those facts that we're discussing here today that the role of the IDB in the private sector, let me underscore private sector, has never been more important than it is today. Uh, in March, we released our macroeconomic report and we launched our Vision 2025, which is our blueprint for supporting economic and social recovery and sustainable growth uh, in the region. And it's a guide for reinvesting in the Americas, really, to have the opportunities to not have, despite this setback, uh, that we've suffered last year to not have another lost decade. And it comes at a time when decisions are going to have such tremendous power to really tip the scales. So I really look forward to discussing these further with you. And I'm, you know, it's just part of my personality is who I am, that we believe, I believe the positive scenarios for the whole region are possible. Of course, we understand the pace and quality of the public health recovery is going to be the first determining factors, and we're going to continue to work tirelessly in that regard, prioritizing every avenue possible so that the region gets the vaccines in particular that it needs to overcome that crisis. But in addition to our optimism, I am proud to say that we responded swiftly. Uh, and we are continuing to respond swiftly uh, with the pandemic. And we're really having a whole of institution effort to assist the region. Uh, our pandemic response from here at the IDB reached about $8 billion and total approvals with sovereign guarantees for 2020 set a record of nearly $13 billion. Also in 2020, uh, the aggregate disbursements from the bank rose about 40% to almost $15 billion. And our private sector arm, which we discussed, IDB Invest, also contributed $9 billion in approvals and resource mobilization. So we're putting our money where our mouth is, and the plan is to really continue to do so at even greater levels in the future. And we're going to have to have those record levels become sustainable in order to really move forward. That said, the flip side, as as, as Bill knows uh, uh, from his from his from his from history, the the public sectors obviously the the, the external financing needs are expected to top 110 billion dollars per year on average over the next 10 years. So there's going to be a lot to be done, and that that brings other challenges uh, there. So I firmly believe. I firmly believe that there's a role to work together with many of you here today, with all of you here today, frankly, to really make a difference in the long-term improvement of the region and to really look for answers and begin finding them. But it's going to be incumbent upon us to take collective action to build those stronger, healthier economies and society. So thank you. I'm going to shut up now. Thank you so much. And I look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mauricio. Uh, I think the work you're doing there uh, I think is incredible. And I'm going to ask you uh, some questions specifically about certain areas. Uh, your predecessor, Luis Alberto Moreno, uh, had, get, uh, had always said uh, from 2010 uh, on up until very recently that uh, this decade, which we're just finishing, would be the decade of the Americas, comparing it with the lost decade of the 1980s. Uh, how do you really see Latin America for the next decade, given the problems uh, that you have mentioned that we all know about COVID uh, and what it's done to the economy and all of the other health problems, economic problems, uh, and security problems that Latin America sees today? You know, I see it as a decade of opportunity. And at the end of the day, it's about reinvesting but we call it the vision 2025 document reinvesting the america's a decade of opportunity and that's for a reason because also the pandemic has unearthed a lot of the deficiencies in the region that are providing us those opportunities but look it's not going to be easy and the whole point here is to not have another lost decade we we all know as i mentioned before that the region experienced about a seven percent loss of gdp in 2020 which is the largest uh, in a single year in recorded history so there's the challenge. And, 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 and this region in particular has suffered unduly uh, due to the fact that it's had weak health infrastructure due to the challenges that added to that with the lockdown enforcement, with the high labor informality that we are all familiar with, uh, and the, really the insufficient connectivity from, for people that need to work at home for the three, the tele-education, tele-work, tele-medicine. So those are challenges, and those challenges are immense. Now, add to that that 2020 the Caribbean hurricane season was one of the worst in recent memories, affecting as well Central America. Four out of the five countries in the world most affected by hurricanes are in Central America and the Caribbean. So that's the second challenge, major challenge, global challenge. And the third is the tragedy of the Venezuelan migrant crisis, which is the worst migrant crisis in the world today. So uh, that's, that's the outlook there. 
we all know that in this in this coming year, you know, assuming assuming uh, that uh, there's a smoother smoother, and I would like to say smooth vaccine rollout, but a smoother vaccine rollout because we're not there yet. That hopefully countries will continue to to will begin to grow and will continue to grow and and do so while fighting the virus. And and so we've seen the estimates of you know growth expected to hit somewhere around five percent, but then revert back to about two and a half, like half of that. So. I think this is possible, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. And and adding to that and further complicating uh, matters, we know that fiscal deficits in the region have risen from 3% in 2019 to now over 8% in 2020, while public debt has increased from nearly 60% in 2019 to over 70% in 2020 and probably will continue rising. So the question for all of us to ask ourselves is really, how can we collectively work with the region to pave that way for recovery and sustained growth uh, and, and development so that we don't lose another decade. So that's why from day one, uh, in October 1st, from the moment I took office, I began working with our experts, economists, and others, and really create this blueprint, because we needed a blueprint for the next five years. How do we achieve that economic and social development after the crisis? And that's what we called Vision 2025. And that vision identifies five priority areas of work for us here at the IDB uh, that can really help us set the path uh, for greater prosperity and resilience. And those five areas are uh, integration and supply chains. But these are opportunities, opportunities that ironically have been unearthed due to the pandemic, which is why I think it's a decade of opportunity. So integration and supply chains, two digitalization, three gen gender equality, four small uh, medium uh, business growth and uh, climate action. And, and, and we really do believe, and we've done all the analysis and really created business lines from these that investing aggressively in these five priority areas are going to allow the region to grow at least at 3% per year to create more formal employment, more integration, more resilience on climate, and really have greater access for women to the, to the financial uh, uh, market. So this is a guide to reinvesting in the Americas, particularly at a time that these decisions are going to have such tremendous power, and really going to set the pathway uh, looking forward. So having a clear focus on what's going to have long-lasting impact is essential and is where we're focused on. Now, it's going to take a lot of work, going to take a lot of co co uh, coordination, I said, but but these really are tremendous uh, opportunities. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to save a lot of the details of, of the vision in that regard so that we can, we can follow up later, uh, along, and also along with the strategic work of the IDB for, for the panel discussion we can talk about later. But, but let me invite all of our partners here, everyone who's here, let me take this opportunity. I'm always, I'm always pitching from the public sector, the philanthropic sector, academia, civil society, the business community, more importantly, to really join us in this agenda. And one of the things we're doing with the private sector is we're creating working groups. So for the first time, it's not literally, and we launched in February, the largest private sector partnership uh, with the bank and incorporating all of these companies into our work stream, uh, each of these five work streams so that we share opportunities, we share how we can work together, what you're seeing, what we're seeing, what you're seeing on the ground, what we're seeing and how to put these things together. And that's gonna be key. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the biggest legacies that we wanna leave. Well, I, I think that's a very uh, hopeful and optimistic view. And of course, the okay. American Development Bank uh, will take a leadership role. Could you say something about the support that uh, the IDB is, is uh, giving to Latin American countries and the Caribbean in the area of vaccines? Because I know you announced a program of over a billion dollars to try and support uh, the distribution of vaccines in Latin America, but perhaps uh, Mauricio, you could give us more details on that. Yeah. Vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. At the end of the day, there's a direct correlation between uh, the rate of vaccination and how quickly and how accelerated we can move on that recovery. Unfortunately, in the last two weeks, we're seeing a record surge in those number of cases I mentioned earlier, uh, deadliest week uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So it's not over yet. And, the, and the, obviously the vaccines are most important. The elevated number of deaths we're seeing has obviously hit the vulnerable uh, the hardest, and it's really one of the tragic consequences here. Uh, uh, you know, we see that there is also health services, uh, maternal, neonatal uh, care, which has been impeded really, uh, and 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 increasing the risk of significant setbacks in health outcomes. So, so we know, and we've known that we needed to act fast and act now. And the vaccination is going to be key to kickstarting the economic recovery. Let me give you kind of a broad picture here. As of today among our 26 borrowing member countries, only seven of them have administered more than 10 doses per 100 people. That's Chile, Uruguay, Barbados, Brazil, Argentina, Panama, and Costa Rica. Seven out of 26. 
So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And when we look at the significant health, social, and economic costs that are associated with COVID, you know, ensuring also the equitable access to safe and effective vaccines is really going to be the most important intervention that we can do to establish uh, uh, those essential services and reactivate the, the economies. But as you all know, and everybody follows in the news, access to the vaccine in the region has been complicated, to say the least, and unequal. And I think there's a series of reasons uh, for this, and that's production constraints that we're seeing uh, globally. I've said the biggest challenge that we're facing right now is a democratization of vaccines, and, and there's also an issue there with the production. Uh, difficulties offering manufacturers sufficient liability protections, which is something we've tried to address. And obviously, uh, um, the fact that high-income countries, United States, Europe, et cetera, have really reserved that production capacity. So we've estimated that high-income countries have secured over 3.5 vaccine doses per person. Just look at this contrast, right? 3.5 vaccine doses per person, while low middle income countries have secured less than 0.6, right? So that's a huge disparity there, which we're very concerned with. And, and, and despite the bilateral agreements, the great intentions of the COVAX facility, which we're working uh, very, very, very strongly with, and, and the donations that we're seeing from uh, uh, borrowing member countries, you know, still half of our borrowing countries. So 13 out of 26 of our borrowing nations are unable to secure vaccine doses for more than half of their population. Um, that's a problem. Seven countries may have enough doses to cover over 50% of their population, and only about six are on track to, re to, reach, over a to reach all 100% of their population. So that's the, the, the decision. Whether or not this translates you know, into doses administered by the end of 2021, <laughs> That's the big question because the timely delivery of those doses is going to depend on the manufacturer's ability, the production, trade restrictions, et cetera, uh, transit, transportation. So that's where we're focused. What we have done here at the IDB, we committed, and I said so on day one, I challenged our team and within, within 100 days, we not only committed 1.2 billion in new approvals for all the health operations throughout uh, the countries, uh, but uh, we, we were able to as well secure a billion dollars uh, just for the vaccine. So an additional billion dollars uh, to the vaccines. And, and in that regards, you know, from the 1.2 billion that we did for the health systems, we had about 15 countries that requested support from us and were able to purchase, you know, diagnostics, medical supplies, et cetera. Uh, we were also able to help reconfigure hospitals, do training, uh, adopt new information systems, management practices. And, and, and let's be clear, that did improve the capacity for testing, we just saw Argentina did. We just helped them purchase uh, a million dollars worth of new additional tests just this week, and this has helped with the treatment. Uh, but um, there is a problem. So these efforts need to be ongoing. The extra billion dollars on the vaccine front were extraordinarily important to support purchases through bilateral contracts and the multilateral efforts, including Covax. But remember, Covax is only to cover 20% of the populations, and that's going to be. So we still got to go look from 20% forward. So. You know, and that entails a whole ecosystem, cold chain equipment, training, communication strategies, and that's, and that's an issue. In regards to vaccines in particular, uh, we have been supporting 10 countries uh, on the vaccine purchases, mostly the smaller vulnerable nations, and obviously we're in, in conversations with others. Technical support is going to be huge. We've been also providing a lot of technical assistance, including, you know, vaccine deployment, the planning, implementation, logistics, um, and working closely with uh, PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, on that front. And we are the first and only international financial institution that has created a guarantee initiative. And, and this new initiative has, you know, essentially has providing manufacturers with assurances regarding claims for harms that can potentially be related to the vaccines. And we're working on really launching our first one uh, with a country and a manufacturer, which is coming up soon, because that's one of the big issues that uh, we've heard from uh, our borrowing nations was, was an issue. We called it the Guarantee Initiative for COVID-19 Vaccines Related Indemnities, GIVRI. And, and obviously, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to uh, see if we can have an impact there. We, we, we feel very hopeful uh, in that regards. Uh, PAHO is gonna be key because COVAX only covers 20%. So this is a good example of multilateral co cooperation. Uh, and we're gonna have to continue doing so and not only <clears throat> in regards to surveys and, 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 and distribution, but also looking to future. And that's something that IDB Invest is doing. And by the way, you know, Swiss companies are leaders in the pharmaceutical industry. We need to have production capacity in the region. Uh, and that's a great opportunity and a great opportunity for investment uh, and obviously something that, the, that, the, that, that this uh, crisis has, uh, has put forth. So we want to help enable the production of more reliable vaccines in the countries, in the region. And that's obviously going to be a partnership with, with the private sector. So not just PAHO, 
We've, we work with everyone, Gavi, World Bank. We're going to continue to do so, and that collaboration is going to be key uh, in, in, in those efforts. But looking towards, looking towards the future, I think production is going to be key. I think we still need to figure out how to mitigate those effects. And, and I'm really, and I, I want to reiterate this because I'm obsessed with this. Uh, one of the legacies of this has to be, and we're working with, through IDB Invest, our private sector arm, discussing financing options with regional laboratories. And please, you know, uh, uh, Swiss laboratories that are watching us, in regards to expanding future production in the region. Lots to be done, and we need your partnership and your help uh, to do so. So um, that's what we're doing. I think that's uh, great, Mauricio. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, that I co-authored a piece on uh, the basis of the old debt for equity, but this would be debt for vaccines with an epidemiologist, Christina Valencia, who happens to be on this call. And since we have so many of the pharmaceutical companies here, it's something that I would recommend the IDB look, you know, yep. look into seriously, because as you point out, there's still a tremendous need with all of that you are doing and uh, supported by the World Bank and others, uh, because this is a problem that we need to really hit right off the bat, as you were saying, because otherwise it's gonna continue to drag Latin America and the Caribbean down uh, for another couple of uh, years. So I would just recommend that uh, you might look at that That's as I said, idea. also the pharmaceutical companies that are on the line. Uh, let's go on now to the Venezuelan refugee situation, which you covered in your opening remarks. Uh, having spent a number of years of my life in Venezuela, um, it's very sad to see what's going on there uh, with the government of Maduro and uh, previously with Chavez in the sense of uh, the problem of refugees, which now exceeds supposedly 5 million. And it's had a tremendous economic effect uh, on countries uh, where these refugees have gone. Uh, as you know, President Duque of Colombia just recognized uh, the, the official status of a million and a half, and I give him a lot of credit for and courage to do that. But what are your comments on where you see this Venezuelan refugee situation going? And what thoughts do you have of, uh, of an active role, which you already have, but a more active role with trying to help these refugees get settled and obviously see what can be done with a country of origin in trying to support what the IDB is doing. Yeah. And, and, and Bill, as, as you said, and, and let, me, let me just say from the outset that the international community has failed the Venezuelan migrant crisis, uh, has failed in particular in comparison to the Syrian crisis, uh, but, but it has failed. And one of the things that we're doing is ensuring that we're taking that leadership role to support these. But the issue here is that this is not only an ongoing crisis that impacts Venezuela, uh, and obviously we know that there's a bigger political crisis, as you alluded to, uh, there and, and affecting that uh, population, but this affects just about every country in the region. Uh, and this was already something that was a major issue before the pandemic began. As you mentioned, over the past years, we're talking, we're, we're at over five and a half million people have fled Venezuela. So now it's the world's worst humanitarian crisis outside of a war. And, and second only and barely and really catching up, but at, at the pace it's outpacing the Syrian refugee crisis. And yet, and then this is where the international community has failed, yet it's only received one tenth, one tenth of the funding per capita of Syria, Venezuelan versus uh, Syrian uh, refugees. So 10 cents for every dollar uh, spent on a Syrian refugee has been spent on Venezuela. And so the international community really needs to step up. And, and clearly we here at the IDB, we've been working with our member countries and engaging worldwide um, stakeholders to really try to show uh, greater generosity and solidarity with the region. And, and we, from our own resources, have invested over $80 million uh, and, and donor funds. And there's been some leaders in this regards in Canada, the United States, uh, um, Spain, Japan have really stepped up. Korea have really stepped up. Switzerland has been, has been supportive, have really stepped up. And we, but we need to do so much more. We have currently here from the bank five approved operations for over $400 million to support Venezuelan migrants in different countries in the region. Four of those, of course, are in Colombia, which is the country that mostly 
mostly has been receiving these uh, these migrants, but also one in Ecuador. And they've been blending. We've been blending financing from the IDB and then from Asian and European uh, country donors. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of this. Uh, just in Colombia, we announced uh, an investment of over 13 million to help integrate Venezuelan migrants into five uh, Colombian cities. Uh, we also approved over $150 million project to make the social security system there more sustainable uh, to be able to help increase health coverage uh, for Venezuelans. Uh, in Ecuador, we're helping over uh, 70,000 uh, or so migrants access everything from social protection to education, health services, and a particular emphasis there on treating of pregnant women. And we also uh, mobilized uh, nearly $50 million from our migration facility and donor funds for all sorts of programs uh, to be able to help with different things like um, challenges like access to registration documentation, basic services, water, sanitation, housing, the social services we discussed economic opportunities, because the flip side is that, you know, once integrated, you know, these are highly productive communities that add to uh, the economies. We're seeing that in Colombia, the positive effect that it can have uh, on the economies, and that's going to be important. Uh, but really, the success that we've been able to have in helping uh, in this regards, and so much more that needs to be done, has been in, in, in part to donor support. Um, uh, and we've done, you know, over 20, almost $20 million uh, on different, you know, operational issues and, and, and things of the sort. But also the technical side, knowledge, and knowledge is going to be key. And by the way, hopefully, Bill, and, and this is, you know, I will come knocking on your door, we can have uh, uh, an opportunity to help rebuild uh, and reconstruct uh, uh, Venezuela. And so therefore the technical support, looking at the analyzing the dimensions of the impact, uh, but you know, from the migration side uh, on all of those issues, but other you know, topics as well uh, in that regard. So working with our partners, working with you is gonna be essential uh, in that regards. And that's something that we're gonna uh, focus on uh, during this crisis and, 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 and then with keeping an eye, a hopeful eye uh, towards, towards, towards the future. And by the way, also, as I mentioned before, in regards to PAHO, et cetera, working, collaborating with the UN agencies, uh, UNHCR, uh, the International Organization of Migration, uh, as well as other multilaterals like the World Bank as well. Uh, we've been coordinating closely with them. Our migration fund is, is nearly depleted, so we need uh, a replenishment uh, of that. Uh, we are currently serving uh, as, a, as a member of the steering committee for their upcoming conference on solidarity with, with, with the migrants and refugees from Venezuela, which is being coordinated this year by Canada. Again, Canada has really been stepping up here. And we're also establishing alliances with private sectors, uh, 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 entities, uh, uh, the Tent Partnership for Refugees comes to mind, which has, has been doing a great job, but also private firms, MasterCard, Telefonica, uh, other public and private organizations in the diaspora have been really helpful. And then through, uh, and, and I'll conclude with this, through our innovation lab, IDB Lab, which we're the only international financial institution that has this innovation hub, uh, IDB Lab, we've been doing really interesting things we did with uh, with USAID uh, we created something that was called better together challenge uh, which we sought to you know crowdsource uh, solutions for support to migrants uh, in that regards and we also uh, launched something called mig innovation alongside the governments of Canada and Colombia uh, and and some private sector actors like Walmart Chobani uh, Claro in, in Colombia uh, to also be creative of how we can help uh, find opportunities and incorporate those uh, those uh, those uh, those migrant mi migrant populations in that regard so you know this is something that we're going to take also to our American business dialogue and and hoping uh, to to work with Swiss companies American companies everyone in in how to uh, uh, do so but let me just take one last advantage because I always have to finish with a pitch. Let me take advantage of this platform to share also that we've joined what's called the, the group of friends of the Quito process to respond to this mi migratory crisis uh, and and ask for all of your uh, uh, support to within these working groups uh, to take advantage of, of the opportunities and to help us in, in this regards and to replenish our, migrate, our migrant fund. Thank you. I think it's very important the key role that you're taking uh, in trying to do something uh, with the Venezuelan refugee problem. Just going forward now, we have another refugee problem in Central America, particularly yeah. with Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, in the sense of this tremendous surge that we're seeing through Mexico on into the United States. And I, for one, as I mentioned to you in our earlier conversation a while back, um, have been promoting the idea of some sort of a Marshall Plan type arrangement uh, which would incorporate Mexico and Colombia sort of as bookends. Uh, obviously, 
uh, working with the IDB uh, on trying to put together a plan uh, that can really stabilize these countries so you don't have the uh, tens of thousands, now hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to get through to, uh, to Mexico on to the United States with all the problems that uh, you have. Uh, and uh, I would like your, your thoughts on, on what role the IDB could play in that because <clears throat> these refugees are leaving because of security reasons, economic reasons and health reasons. Yeah. So first and foremost, we're going to take you up on, on, on that offer and, and, and continue to work with you on this front. Look, there's a, there already is a Marshall Plan in regards to, 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 to the region, and that's called the capitalization of the Inter-American Development Bank. And so this is going to be key into regards to what we can do and obviously uh, which you've already gotten a taste from in everything we've discussed, but really how we can magnify that and scale that uh, forward. And hopefully, and look, this is one of the legacies that I, wanted, that I want to leave with this presidency. Hopefully, uh, not only the countries in the region, which they understand the importance of the IDB, but hopefully the United States is going to understand uh, for the first time in decades, the importance of the IDB and the role that the IDB can play. And the reality has been that, you know, for the last, it's been 30 years since the United States supported a clean capital increase uh, for the Inter-American Development Bank. That was back almost in 1994. Uh, and in and, and 2010, there was capital increase, but it was only conditioned only to support Haiti. Um, so hopefully that lesson has been learned uh, because others have filled that vacuum, as we all know, and, and that therefore the IDB can play the role, the leading role that it should be able to play in all of these crises and not just refugee crisis from Venezuela, but as you mentioned, in regards to Central uh, America. Look, there's compounded issues in regards to Central America and uh, the reason for uh, the continued uh, flow of, of migrants, uh, particularly obviously coming to the United States. Uh, we need to be able to help, and we have done so from the IDB uh, in the past and in different programs. But I think that we have to look at those and what we've been doing and discussing with the United States and with our, with our, with our borrowing nations, so Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, how we can work with them to have learned lessons from the past and how we can create programs and initiatives looking forward based on those lessons. And what's gonna be key here, I think the biggest lesson that has been learned is the importance for both public and private sector buy-in. Uh, you know, it's, it's not by coincidence we're here with the Chambers of Commerce and again talking about the private sector. If both aren't bought in, it's going to be very difficult to succeed. So we're working on an initiative, and obviously uh, we look forward to your continued input uh, on an initiative that we sh soon uh, should be able to unveil, which will be complementary to the efforts, obviously, of the United States and others with the Central American countries, but really based on bridging that public-private uh, gap um, and how we can help those countries in their uh, uh, in their development, uh, in job creation and opportunities. But there's also simple things that can be done. Here's one example, uh, two, two things that, stand, that, 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 that really you know, stand out. And this is something that's also going to hopefully inspire the United States to participate. And by the way, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful uh, in regards to this Marshall Plan capitalization uh, of the IDB uh, because the Senate Foreign Relations Committee just marked up last week in, a, in legislation uh, an, a historic $80 billion capitalization uh, of the bank in a bipartisan, in an overwhelming bipartisan faction. So uh, this is a great opportunity. So it's the first clean capital increase in 30 years. And by the way, the first time in history that does so even before there's a resolution. So, so we're, we're, we're succeeding in that, in, that, in, that, in that awareness. But, but something really important in this regards is that we need to make sure that engaged with all of those stakeholders, we are invested, that we are bringing them in only in the way that the IDB can do. And that's going to be a, a clear uh, in, in, in that channel. And we're going to work in a complementary fashion, obviously, with all of those. Uh, and I think that there is uh, a unique opportunity. And also, by the way, uh, with, with a good Citibank uh, uh, background, one of the reasons why I brought, uh, I nominated for our executive vice president, the highest ranking Latin American woman in the history of this bank, uh, a wonderful Citibank uh, banker, uh, Reina Irene Mejia, who you know, um, is precisely because she, she was a CEO of, uh, <clears throat> of Citibank. Uh, she's Honduran uh, in the region and has the ability to bring those stakeholders together in an apolitical fashion to really create those opportunities. But then there's also simple things that could be done because I think what's also creating urgency is the fact that you have, if, if we don't deal with this issue, you're really gonna have 30 million people migrate to the United States over the next 30 years. So this is gonna be a, a big issue that needs to be dealt with now and, and, and dealt with uh, uh, concretely uh, now. But also here's, here's but simple things that could be done. 
from the United States perspective, you know, CAFTA is a wonderful opportunity. But CAFTA, believe it or not, because of North Carolina uh, textile manufacturers, of the 1,050 thread lines that can be imported to the United States, only allows 25 to be imported from Central America. Textile industry is a huge opportunity in Central America, huge, huge. If we were just allowed to expand those, and it has to only be done by Congress, give proclamation authority, as it's called, to the administration to expand those thread lines from 25 to, let's say, 250 or 500, that would quadruple exports from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador to the United States in textiles and would allow for more high-end uh, production of textiles. You know how many jobs that can create? That's thousands and thousands of jobs. That's thousands of opportunities right there at home uh, in, those, in those countries in the region. So there's a whole comprehensive toolbox that can be used a little here, a little there. Obviously, uh, we, we, we look forward to taking a leading role uh, in, that, in that regards. <clears throat> but there are solutions, uh, and there are clear solutions. Uh, and the whole thing is about creating and putting those stakeholders together to do so in a comprehensive manner. Well, I think that's uh, very heartening uh, to hear that, Mauricio. You might want to comment on how you see the trade agreements um, that exist in Latin America, perhaps combining Mercosur, Pacific Alliance, and the new version of NAFTA, and whether you see as a possibility uh, something that was discussed very heavily under George Bush Sr. and uh, also uh, on several other presidents, uh, uh, basically Bill Clinton, uh, about the idea of a, uh, a Latin American free trade agreement uh, going right up through the Americas. Do you see that as something that the IDB believes in, uh, is willing to push? Uh, do you see it as realistic or it's pie in the sky? I'd be very interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, <clears throat> it's absolutely realistic. Um, okay. It's absolutely necessary. Is it realistic? I think what first needs to be done is the harmonization of the nearly 30 intra-regional trade agreements that currently exist. I mean, just the lack of harmonization of those agreements, and you mentioned some of them, you know, it, 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 it costs, costs, costs the region $20 billion in, 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 in exports and production. So just the, all of the, you know, and by the way, we're seeing now in Mercosur, like just within Mercosur, you know, uh, 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 arguments within uh, in regards to, you know, what kind of, uh, um, to the flexibility that is needed in that regards. But if there's no flexibility, you know, that harmonization is going to be very difficult. And at the end of the day, it is costing the region at least $20 billion uh, in, in, in exports. And that's a big problem. That's something that needs to be done. But look, here's the reality, though. And I think that here's where the opportunity lies. The opportunity does lie in, in this whole concept that we call nearshoring. And, and the reality is, and obviously it, it will be even further anticipated uh, if, if, if these trade agreements were harmonized. But the real thing is that even in the 1990s, when you mentioned when, when then President uh, uh, George H.W. Bush and then President Clinton uh, in a bipartisan way had been talking about this free trade uh, area of, of the Americas, the political rhetoric was there, but the corporate will was looking towards China. And by the way, I just told you about the Central America example, where where those twenty five thread lines are are are, are is what is what CAFTA restricts because it's a restriction. It's literally it's a free trade a free trade agreement that has a restriction for twenty five thread lines from uh, Central America. You know where the thread lines are currently, where those imports of those more luxury high end luxury items are coming from? They're coming from China. They're coming from China. Now, would it not benefit the United States more to have more thread lines be allowed to be produced in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, quadruple their exports, create more jobs and more opportunities than having them imported from, uh, from, from China in that regards? Look, I think you can, if, I'm not a U.S. policymaker anymore, but I think that, that's, that's a fair argument. So the opportunities are there. The rhetoric was there in the 90s. But now I think the corporate will after the pandemic, and once again, this is reinvesting in America's decade of opportunity. What are those opportunities? What opportunities did the pandemic uh, 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 unveil? One of those was the cost in regards to health security and reliability uh, amidst the crisis. So when the crisis hit, you know, the borders in some of these countries in, in Asia shut down completely, particularly in China, and th there was an opportunity cost for the first time in decades for companies that were based precisely there. Meanwhile, here in the region, we were able to work with those companies in ensuring that those trade lines continued. So there's now a health security 
uh, argument for nearshoring. And then we saw what happened in the Suez Canal. And we see, and so, and so I would argue that now you have a, a transportation security. Uh, uh, so you have exhibit A and exhibit B of why the opportunity exists, of why we need to take advantage of this uh, nearshoring trend. But the region needs to help itself. And in helping itself, one of the biggest things it could do, as you just mentioned, is through the harmonization of these agreements. And if that harmonization of those agreements leads to a free trade area of the Americas, then you know, you and I are going to go have a party, Bill. Thank you very much, Mauricio. I'm going to ask you two more questions uh, so I don't have to keep interrupting you. Uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. One is, is as you know, China has uh, been lending very heavily to Latin America uh, over the last five or six, almost a decade, uh, starting in Venezuela for oil and other extractive uh, possibilities that they saw. But also a lot of countries uh, in Latin America, particularly Ecuador, piled on a lot of, of debt with, uh, through the One Belt, One Road program of China. Uh, the G20 and the IMF World Bank have come out with this program, this framework program to help countries that have debt problems uh, try and restructure and finance them. How do you see the role of the IDB in this process of the framework working uh, on situations? Argentina obviously is facing a major problem with the upcoming negotiations for the International Monetary Fund for its debt, which is the largest uh, single outstanding loan from the International Monetary Fund uh, and China's role in all of this. Uh, and then if you could add uh, one more thing to our inventory of questions, if you could end this with saying something about uh, what the uh, IDB is doing in the area of green finance and, and climate. Okay. So let me start with, 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 with your China question, which is a very good question. Look, first and foremost, in kind of setting the premise, you know, my focus is obviously on ensuring that the region recovers from the pandemic and fulfills that potential we just discussed uh, previously. So, you know, I'm, this, this isn't about politics, it's about opportunities. As you know, China is a non-borrowing member uh, of the IDB group. And, and, and as you know as well, it's no secret that China has taken uh, uh, advantage of both the leadership and the investment vacuum in the region and was welcomed as an IDB shareholder in 2010, uh, which then led to a decade of China ramping up investments, debt, uh, lending, and, and increased influence, frankly, uh, in, the, in the Americas. However, that said, China's lending has plunged to just about zero uh, uh, recently, and, and, and the region needs more help than ever, which is why the IDB plays an important role, because there's no uh, country in the region that would not prefer for uh, China, for the IDB to be uh, their, their, their lending partner of choice rather than China. Uh, and by the way, in that regards, even the, the policy banks uh, um, um, of, of the Chinese policy banks did not make any new loans in, in 2020. So this is an opportunity for not only for there to be a stronger, more replenished IDB, but for it to have the opportunity uh, for the IDB to, to, to make sure that it is and remains the lender of choice, the partner of choice uh, of the region. At the end of the day, it's the region's bank. You know, we're, 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 it's, a co it's, a, it's a cooperative and we all work together and have that, that opportunity. Now you've, you've heard me advocate for companies to expand their operations in the region, to create jobs, to ramp up private uh, investment, to help stimulate that recovery uh, uh, and, and, and really look for that, that new decade. As I was saying before, Here's that opportunity. You know, we've seen survey after survey uh, uh, show that 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 almost you know 30 percent uh, of of the of the of the biggest companies uh, invested in, in in China have either moved sourcing uh, and manufacturing or plan to do so by 2023. That's a huge opportunity. If we here, if Latin America and the Caribbean just captured 10 percent, just 10 percent of goods that the U.S. already imports from China, that Latin America and the Caribbean also produces and imports, that would add $70 billion per year in exports from the region. That's that's game changer. So this, this should be opportunities that it's attractive to everybody, to governments, to private firms. Uh, everyone stands to benefit from, from, from these opportunities. And, and, and obviously, uh, in, in investment from all throughout uh, the world is going to be essential to this. Now, in regards to debt, uh, before I talk about climate 
So we've talked about debt, and, and obviously it's important to acknowledge that you know debt was already growing in Latin America and the Caribbean before COVID, right? But now it's clearly growing faster uh, because we see falling tax revenues and, and obviously the, the required spending that we're seeing on health and fiscal support packages. The average debt to GDP ratio could surge to almost 80% this year uh, from almost 60% before COVID. And obviously that's something we need to be anticipating and keep an eye on. And you and I have talked about uh, uh, re- introducing and recreating and we are going to launch from here a, uh, a capital markets advisory committee from the bank to start working with these countries in, in, in that regard. Now, as countries work to strengthen their, their fiscal balances, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be important that significant loans are weighed against the reality uh, uh, of the pandemic. And, and as we all know, while China has agreed to provide relief on official bilateral debt, there is obviously um, um, still considerable financing from the banks that are structured as commercial loans uh, that are impacting countries. So while the development banks are down, there's still a, an issue that we need to, 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 to look forward to. So I believe, and it's my legacy, it's the reason I ran, that the IDB is unequivocally the lender and partner of choice of Latin America and the Caribbean. And there's a reason we're the most important development finance institution in the Western Hemisphere, because we present the best value proposition to be able to accomplish those critical goals that we've talked about today that are good for the region. And that's why also I'm advocating tirelessly uh, to the United States to recognize that role, to recognize that opportunity as its largest shareholder, as a 30% shareholder. And that's why I'm also encouraged uh, that for the first time in 30 years, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee marked up legislation for uh, authorizing a capital increase for the bank, and hopefully that will continue moving uh, through the process. So I, I'm always uh, hopeful in that regard. So let me address uh, uh, climate uh, and climate finance before we, we, we move, uh, uh, move up to more questions. Look, first and foremost, I'm from Florida, right? So, and in Miami, I grew up seeing a Biscayne Bay that is completely different from Biscayne Bay today. So when we talk about the impacts of climate, you know, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen those levels change, you know, and I've seen what that means for the city of Miami and for downtown Miami and for Brickell and for those of you that know Miami. So it's a real threat to the region's development and as I mentioned at the, at, the, at the outset, four or five countries most affected by climate change and these climate events in the region are in Central America and the Caribbean. So we saw with Hurricane Zeta and Iota what, what that means. The higher intensity storms are already impacting national GDPs by you know, four or 5% in the Caribbean and Central America. And, and, and something that we've been talking about a lot, and we just, uh, um, you know, um, we're, today we're launching a green finance uh, uh, transparency initiative in that regards. You know, by 2050, we could suffer about $100 billion in climate related damages every year, uh, unless we uh, limit uh, some of this global warming. So I believe that we should look at climate action as a climate, as an economic opportunity instead of a cost. And so it shouldn't be zero sum. And that's where the key is gonna be. And, and studies support this. We show that for every dollar invested in resilience brings you know five to $10 in returns. And, and, and we believe that decarbonization across the region can net you know, up to 15 million jobs uh, 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 over the next decade, which should be important. We're seeing uh, um, improvements in, in Costa Rica, who, which launched a decarbonization plan, uh, and that could bring their country you know, $40 billion in benefits by 2050 uh, and, and huge opportunities for private investment. So I do think that there is an opportunity for positive change here. And I personally, you know, I personally, with my life story, I'm committed to ensuring that climate remains core of our business and that our work uh, 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 that we work with a country's commitments uh, to the Paris Agreement uh, in, in that regards. And we're working in that regards from a technical assistance perspective. We're helping governments with technical aid for policy planning to align their operations, to accelerate change by accessing uh, concessional finance for, for, for climate action. And we're helping up to 15 countries uh, to update their, their, their climate action plans in, in that regards. So I really do believe that support for long-term planning to achieve net zero uh, emissions by 2050 can help countries uh, stage your effort. But let me, let me, let me, uh, oh, I'm going to add one more thing because this is also important for Central America, Bill, because you mentioned it before. It's very also important. If you, if you look at what are, what are the lessons learned from Central America, let's say for the Alliance for, for Prosperity, which was the previous Central America plan that the United States had uh, um, um, and then Vice President uh, uh, Biden um, uh, worked on, which was 
a very well-intentioned effort, which had good things in it, uh, but obviously did not have full impact, right? So we need to now improve upon. Look, one of the key things is something that we learned for climate as well too. Ministries of finance need to be implemented as partners. The role ministries of finance, whether it's for, you know, whether it's on a migration initiative or on a climate initiative, you know, as you know, ministries of finance, you know, control the purse. And in that regards, have to be mainstreamed into uh, um, um, uh, uh, the climate policy decisions uh, in the government. It's going to be absolutely key. Whole of government <clears throat> approaches are key to sustainable development in that regards. So we're working uh, also with governments to ensure that there's those whole of government approaches, whether, as I mentioned, in Costa Rica with their decarbonization plan, there's another good one, which is the Barbados with the Roofs to Reefs program, which is a great model uh, 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 that we're also very proud of. So we're going to continue to align uh, our policy and investment loans in, in that regards uh, and, 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 in, and in so doing. And let me just cap it off with, with, one, with one last thing. We launched at our annual meeting in Barranquilla the uh, Amazon uh, bioeconomy fund. So I, I stated from the outset when I ran that we were going to create the first uh, climate fund here uh, at the IDB, and we did so. It's called this the Amazon bioeconomy fund, and we have uh, almost a billion dollars in, in, in contributions to it already uh, uh, committed. But here's why I believe it's the most important climate project in the world today. It has the buy-in of all seven countries of the Amazon the buy-in of all seven countries of the Amazon. So it's not politics and picking who's at fault and who has a, who's done more, who's done less, et cetera. This is essentially burden sharing amongst those seven countries. And it was launched at Barranquilla, uh, obviously by myself, but President Duque, President Bolsonaro of uh, Brazil as well. It's with this confidence building and with this mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, burden sharing that we can have everyone step up and everyone to work together to achieving our mutual climate goals here so that those communities in the Amazon can further uh, 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 develop so that um, countries can continue to grow uh, and, 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 and succeed uh, and have development in all of their communities while simultaneously ensuring that we are uh, protecting one of Earth's uh, greatest treasures, uh, and, uh, uh, and which is obviously uh, the Amazon. And we're very proud to have been taking to take a leadership role uh, in that regards. And, and we urge uh, all of you to work uh, closely with us on that. Thank you very much, Mauricio. On that optimistic note, I'm going to turn this back to Tatiana for, for questions. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Claver Carone, Mr. Rhodes. I have four questions, one of which has been waiting for half an hour. By the way, for our viewers, we are adding another 15 minutes to this webinar, which is uh, really interesting. So I'm taking a question from Carlos Arrocha. I agree with Mr. Claver Carone that the pandemic has unearthed areas of opportunity, but at the same time, it has revealed the fact the quality of public administration will matter in a post-pandemic world. Countries like Mexico or Brazil have been unable to contain the pandemic and together with Argentina have increased their budget deficits. Why does Mr. Claver Caroni think that the economic future will not be an extrapolation of the past few years? I mean, it, sure, it can be, but that's our, my job is to help prevent it from being that. Look, the biggest, what, what, if you ask me what's my biggest concern today is we're seeing commodity prices increase throughout the region, right? So for different, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, commodities that are important to the region. So we're seeing copper, uh, uh, you're seeing uh, soybeans, uh, uh, et cetera. As commodity prices go up, the big question is going to be, I mean, this is where, where, where the, the proof is going to be in the pudding, as we say. Do we, does the region learn from the mistakes of the past and essentially not invest those resources in populist program. I've said now, you know, I've kind of become my, my, my line of sort, you know, that the success of the region is going to depend on PPPs, but the right PPPs, public private partnerships, not power politics and populism. So if all of that becomes invested again, in these populist short-term programs, looking for an election that's coming up in the legislature or elsewhere in the next few months to keep, you know, certain constituencies happy, then the region's in trouble. Um, However, if the lesson has been learned, Latin America and the Caribbean, as the question rightfully points out, is has woefully 
lagged in regards to infrastructure and infrastructure development. It's at the core of just about every problem uh, the region has. And the pandemic has unveiled that. By the way, despite the fact that it has the greatest impact on the economy. So, you know, investing $1 in infrastructure nets two, three, $4 uh, in return. But yet, despite that, the choice has always been the short-term satisfaction of a populist political program. So getting through that is really going to be the test. Uh, and we are doing everything possible. And I think the pandemic, I truly believe it. I believe it in my heart of hearts that the pandemic has brought an opportunity whereby it's unveiled all of those weaknesses uh, in the infrastructure. Uh, and, and therefore, it's, it's, going to, it's almost going to increase the demand and the social pressures to increase and, and, and support uh, uh, those infrastructure uh, investments. And my job is to uh, not rest uh, to try to make that happen uh, and judge me uh, on my results in 2025 when my term is over, whether we made some progress or not. Um, the next question is not anonymous, but I will not say the name. What do you think about the situation in Peru with the possibility that the next president is going to be a communist terrorist? We, I, we, 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 we look forward to, you know, the, there's a democratic process and we respect the democratic processes and uh, we will work with, uh, we, we look forward to, to uh, the result of the will of the Peruvian people uh, and obviously we'll, we'll work with uh, uh, the leadership that, that they decide and, and obviously we will advise on what we believe are uh, the best policies that lead to uh, economic growth and prosperity uh, and, and integration and, and increased trade. Like, like Peru is, is a country with extraordinary uh, potential. I mean, it just, it truly is. Um, and, and based on uh, its, 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 its export, its, its, export mar its, its, its export potential and its commodities and things of the sort, it really truly has a, a huge opportunity for fast, sustainable development. And, and, but it has not been done so appropriately throughout, right? Um, um, and, and we're seeing, you know, how the inequities that, that have been formed throughout the years um, and over, over decades, you know, obviously have uh, 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 create political pressures. Uh, and so it's going to be incumbent, incumbent uh, upon uh, whoever is elected uh, and future leaders in Peru uh, to really ensure that that vulnerable populations uh, enjoy the benefits of that economic growth, uh, that the public private partnership, that communities are integrated uh, into uh, uh, the, 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 the commodity uh, 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 boom, into the, the mining opportunities, uh, that they understand how uh, investment can help them, uh, how the trade helps them. Uh, there's, a, there's an educational, there's an integration uh, uh, process. And then obviously uh, there's one about of, of community uh, engagement uh, and development. And, uh, and, and hopefully um, you know, we'll, uh, that will improve uh, so that you know, choices don't have to be uh, so stark. The next... Um... Viewer is anonymous and the question, could you please provide more details about the liability insurance coverage product available for countries? What has been the insurance reinsurance role on the topic? Yeah, so ironically speaking of Peru, it was in a conversation with President, uh, with current President Sagasti that he had mentioned some of the issues that they had been having in their, in their bilateral negotiations with um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies. And what's happening is because of the uh, pressures on supply and obviously then production, et cetera, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies and their in, in, in having a, an excess uh, demand out there, they were picking and choosing. And then obviously, and it, it is what it is, you know, companies are going to, you know, choose their clients in the sense of those that pose the less risk for other financing, et cetera, uh, uh, liability uh, for legal issues, uh, et cetera. So the demands of the pharmaceuticals we started seeing with the bilateral negotiations, in particular with the countries, were becoming more and more diverse and onerous uh, in that regards. And for some countries, uh, basically do in, you know, in the demands of, you know, regulatory legal changes, et cetera, uh, it was becoming more and more difficult to really, in a timely fashion, be able to one comply or catch up to you know these these changing demands of the pharmaceutical companies. So 
what we decided to do was to create a guarantee mechanism whereby we here at the bank would assume uh, uh, some of that uh, 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 some of that liability uh, uh, risk and and therefore hopefully facilitate that negotiation. Um, you know, we launched it a few weeks back. We are in the first stages of where that guarantee will be applied uh, with a co country uh, and, a, and a pharmaceutical in the bilateral negotiations, but it has been well received. Uh, and it is just another example of how we are uh, literally um, waking up and going to sleep every night uh, thinking of how we can help uh, as a development finance institution, how we can help uh, our member, our borrowing nations uh, have a quicker and more effective access to the vaccine. Because by the way, again, let me repeat, I said it before, COVAX is not going to be the ultimate solution. COVAX, even if it worked efficiently, which clearly it has not, only covers 20% of populations. So there is another 80% in most countries. And, and I, I, I told you uh, uh, just what, how few uh, of our borrowing nations will have access to 100% uh, uh, vaccination uh, vaccines for their populations, which is what really keeps me up every day at night. Okay, we now have seven more questions waiting here. I would like to- um, Only? <laughs> suggest that uh, we will we take these seven, but uh, no more after that because um, we all know that you have uh, some other things on your agenda today. So the next viewer is anonymous. Currently, the U.S. administration raised corruption and impunity plus narco activity as the key drivers of poverty, violence, and migration to the U.S. from Central America. Why IDB continue lending money to corrupt government institutions to finance ineffective populist projects like politically biased money transfers, as well as failed investment projects like Transport 150 in Honduras? Well, first and foremost, I, I see that the, the Swiss Chambers of Commerce have very straightforward plain talking uh, 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 members, which, which I enjoy. So, so thank you for the very uh, direct question in, in, in that regards. Hey, look, I have no doubt uh, in the past, you know, one of the things that I want to leave in the, as part of the 21st century, the truly 21st century IDB and part of uh, my mark as, um, um, you know, a, 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 the youngest head of an international uh, financial institution uh, uh, today is really the modernization of the bank. And that means also the increased transparency uh, standards uh, and, and efforts uh, in that regard. And that's one of our priorities. One of the reasons, again, not only Central America, but you know, why, why, why we hired uh, and Reina um, Irene Mejia as our executive vice president is also to act because that role is also supposed to be the chief operating officer of the bank. And it really has never functioned as such, but we're really doing so today. And we're creating you know, buffers and safeguards uh, in order to strengthen uh, um, uh, the integrity of, of our operations throughout. Uh, and that's something that I take very seriously in that, in that we are doing. Um, in the past, there's clearly been some, some, some issues. It's imperfect. It's a complicated a region in that regards. Uh, but we are creating uh, the standards and we're creating uh, the buffers to ensure that some of those uh, uh, things never happen uh, uh, again. As regards today, uh, look, yes, you know, there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is a problem uh, with corruption, not just in Central America, but throughout the region. And we need to help deal with it. Uh, I think that in, if I have one, if I have one not, uh, observation, I would say, in regards to, you know, as we focus on Central America, is that those three countries in Central America aren't the only ones, right? As we see it throughout the region. Uh, and sometimes uh, we find it easy to, you know, just, you know, look for uh, uh, um, uh, one culprit uh, in, in, in three countries, but it's really a, a, a regional problem. So we need to do so in a holistic <laughs> fashion. We need to address those in a holistic fashion, and that's what we're doing. But we're also doing so creatively. So for example, you know, we, we've created, we're just launching today, uh, as we speak, uh, this whole green finance, green bond transparency initiative, whereby you know, we see this booming market uh, for impact investors and, and green bonds, which we're helping launch throughout the region. But investors want to know and by the way, that's a, you know, a multi-trillion dollar uh, market. But investors want to know, you know, essentially 
mm-hmm. what those projects are going for. They want reporting on those projects, et cetera. So we're trying to help in that space. We also just recently launched, which I think is really important and a huge opportunity. A lot of the, the corruption, uh, and it's no secret, we've seen in the past has been through infrastructure projects. So we've created even, even looking at modern applications. So we created this uh, a Build America's app. And what it does is it tries to put take middlemen out of the equation. So essentially for all the projects, the, the multiple billions and billions of dollars worth of, of infrastructure projects that the, that the IDB puts out to ensure that, uh, uh, that the companies and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, the contractors have the ability to uh, uh, have a range of suppliers in country that are identified that they can contact directly to try to take those middlemen out of the equation, which are usually ones that then take, you know, uh, a cut for <laughs> connecting them with their friend or saying, oh, you can only do this project if it's with this person, uh, et cetera. So we are working uh, endlessly internally through uh, uh, strengthening our integrity uh, mechanisms and, and our uh, uh, frameworks and our, and our standards, uh, but also creatively uh, through uh, digitalization, modern technology, et cetera, uh, to help create also more direct lines, direct links, and take middle actors out, uh, which have uh, been the culprits in many regards of, of corruption, corrupt practices for, for so long. And by the way, the other thing we want to do through IDB Invest is you know, also requiring more uh, capital, which is another reason for uh, the capitalization of, 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 of the IDB or this 21st century Marshall Plan, which I like to call it, um, is, is that, that if we have more capital, IDB invest, our private sector arm can also invest more equity. Uh, that's a big priority for us. And if we have more equity uh, in, in a lot of these private sector investments uh, uh, in, in the region, then guess what? We have board seats. And then we can bring good governance uh, to uh, best practices as well and have a greater influence uh, in, in that regards as well. So we're being creative and we're looking at this holistically of how we can address these transparency issues, which is indeed, indeed a challenge, which literally takes a, a big chunk, uh, a cost to region, a big chunk of GDP every year. I would just add to this that I think uh, we have seen uh, the area of, of corruption, not only in infrastructure, but also more recently in vaccines and, and uh, also equipment to fight uh, COVID. So I think your initiative here, Mauricio, is going to be very, very important because it's something that has long been ignored by some of the international financial institutions. I've made my points also uh, to the managing director and to uh, my friend David Malpas about the need to put more emphasis on fighting corruption. And I think the question was an excellent one, Tatiana. The next question is from Philippe Nell. He's the honorary ambassador of our chamber, former head of the Americas at the Secretariat of uh, Economic Affairs of Switzerland. In 1996, we created in Europe a free trade zone system with the European Union, the European Free Trade Association, and the Central and Eastern European states. It implied to link all existing agreements with one set of rules of origin. Would IDB take the leadership in such a great project? Hey, I, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm all ears, uh, and it, it, it sounds... Uh, it sounds uh, right up our alley. Look, the biggest problem here, and, 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 and that's one of the main reasons uh, why uh, this is one of the least integrated uh, uh, regions in the world. You know, Europe, uh, Europe's intra-regional trade is, is about 65% of, of all its trade. So it's like over 60% of all European trade is intra-regional. In Asia, it's over 55%. Latin America and the Caribbean, 15%. 15 percent, um, you know, the need for, for these type of, of, of initiatives, which obviously also take a lot of political will, um, are, 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 are key, uh, as we're seeing with Merkel. So right now, sometimes that political will is not always there, uh, but we're but I'm, 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 I'm always up for the challenge. Then a question from Ambassador Lilian Le Bourbon. She's the ambassador of Paraguay in Switzerland. What is the involvement of IDB to increase education and infrastructure, key at the time to help development of rural and indigenous populations? Great question. Huge, huge. Look, um, 35 million children did not have access to schooling uh, last year because they did not have access to the internet. So the opportunities that have been unveiled 
through the pandemic in the digital sphere and the opportunities that exist in the digital sphere uh, are precisely on teleeducation, telemedicine, and telework as well. Uh, education is going to be key to that. Education will be different now looking forward. Um, it'll never be the same again. Uh, and therefore, uh, those that are the best adept uh, for uh, uh, the new style of education and the ability, the capacity. By the way, 35 million people did not have access, but guess what? Those are 35 million people that would have access to education if we simply not only have greater connectivity in these uh, rural areas, uh, but also uh, a greater quality and cost effectiveness in connectivity uh, throughout. It'd be actually a lot more than 35 million that would have uh, access. So that's kind of a perfect example of where you see the flip you know, the cost, but yet the flip opportunity with a simple, a simple solution. And when we talk about infrastructure a lot, I've also said that where we're focused on right now is digital infrastructure. And why is that my priority? Because look, as important as physical infrastructure is, as important, and obviously there's a whole ecosystem, I get it, but as important as, you know, building a bridge is, you know, over, 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 over five years, you can connect a community nowadays in five weeks. And we need to first and foremost right now focus on the opportunities that digital infrastructure bring. Uh, that's key. Uh, that's huge. Education is really one of those uh, 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 areas that it highlights. And we're going to be soon launching, launching a new Education 4.0 initiative that precisely looks at these uh, opportunities and an entire plan of action precisely based on these opportunities. Then I have another question from Dr. Philip Nell, our honorary ambassador. The Swiss firm Lonza is producing the Moderna vaccine in Switzerland. Investors were invited to finance production lines. Would IDB take the lead to contact Lonza and look at possibilities for producing the Moderna vaccine in Latin America? Yes, yes. Say when, send me your number. Mauricio at IADB.org is my email. Please uh, send me an email. And, uh, and absolutely, uh, like I said, that's one of our legacy items here. We, we need to increase that production. We're looking uh, for uh, partners uh, and I would love uh, to, 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 to have that. So please, please do. Let's please be in contact. Wonderful. Another anonymous um, question. The agricultural sector is playing a leading role in most of Latin American countries in terms of exports products. Forex reserve provider and main income sources for thousands jeopardized by the COVID crisis. However, we are seeing a lot of inefficiencies across Latin countries, such as low productivity, non-resilient smallholder sectors, pressure on biodiversity and carbon stock in soils and forest covers. How is IDB agenda planning to tackle these challenges? Yeah, holistically. The answer is holistically because indeed, you know, all of these uh, issues play a role uh, and, and so therefore we need to look at these issues uh, holistically. By the way, but I will say, and, and I'll keep my answer short on this one, um, one of the things that I've actually really been enjoying is we're actually been doing a lot of uh, these pilot programs uh, aimed particularly at uh, um, the agricultural sector and for vulnerable populations. So uh, we've been doing like reverse uh, uh, engineering on, on supply chains, which is a great opportunity for integration. Um, so for example, with, with PepsiCo, we launched a program in, in Guatemala, a pilot program in Guatemala, uh, Dominican Republic and Ecuador, whereby with <clears throat> women potato farmers, you know, obviously PepsiCo owns Frito-Lay, so you have, you kind of, you're reversing, uh, you obviously, you have the purchaser and then we're reversing the supply uh, chain down uh, and, and, and then helping a lot of these uh, agricultural communities in, in these countries, in particular uh, uh, women and, and other uh, um, 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 vulnerable groups uh, in, in, in those countries and, and particularly amongst the agricultural sector. I'm also talking about that with Imbev uh, and, and would love to, uh, to, to discuss with other, well, I see, I, I see Ramon here as well. We'd love to discuss this with other, uh, I think there's great opportunities uh, in, in, in that regard and, and for us to be creative uh, to address some of these challenges and to look at this uh, uh, holistically. And I'm now taking the last question uh, from Alejandra Paniagua Barajas. What is the IDB doing in relation with gender equality in Central America? Yeah, not just in Central America, throughout the region. Look, there is no, there is not a single effort that we can do that would have a greatest impact on GDP than 
incorporating women equitably into the workplace. If Latin America and the Caribbean in regards to the incorporation of women into uh, the labor market uh, were to reach OECD standards, that would have a 20% impact, positive impact on GDP. That's, that's mind boggling. That's mind boggling. It would have a trillion dollar <laughs> impact on those economies. That's mind boggling. Uh, in that regards, just OECD standards. But by the way, so obviously uh, incorporation into, into the workforce, but then access to financing. That is, th if, if, there is if there is one issue, and, and again, and, and you know, I, I mentioned uh, about, about Reina, and she was a leader on this in regards to in Honduras. Women led small, medium sized enterprises in Latin America and the Caribbean have 10% greater income than those owned by men. So women are the best entrepreneurs in the region, proven, proven. And by the way, they're also the most reliable in paying back their loans. <laughs> and yet, and yet women have 50 to 70% less access to financing for small, medium-sized enterprises in the region than men. Riddle me that, riddle me that. Like what, I mean, Bill's here. What if you have a, a client that you is is ten percent more likely to be is, is likely to be ten percent more successful than, than a male client, more likely to pay back? Why do they have less access to financing? There's clearly a structural uh, issue, and obviously, I mean, there's other. We can talk about this forever. This is a very interesting subject. But if you think about it conceptually, it makes no sense whatsoever. That's a huge opportunity uh, as well, and particularly there. In Central America, Reina was a leader uh, in this regards in, in Honduras, and that's one of the things that we're really focusing on also as part of our uh, Central America uh, initiative in order to really be able to help out in particular, uh, in not only incorporating women into the labor market, but, but helping them have access uh, to financing for their enterprises. Tatiana, before you and Ramon close it out, I'd like uh, to just thank Mauricio uh, for appearing here, but also for the work that he is doing uh, because he gave us a tour de force, I think here on all of the initiatives for the Inter-American Development Bank at this very difficult period, I think uh, that Latin America is going through. And one comes away from his commentary with more optimism that we are not gonna go into another lost decade like the decade of the eighties in Latin America. So I think we have the right person at the right place at the right time uh, doing the job at the IDB. And particularly, he brings something which is very important uh, to the table. He wants to work closely with the private sector. And as he said, and we all know, without the private sector, uh, governments just can't do it. Uh, the private sector has to be involved very, very deeply. So having said that, I turn it back to you. And uh, thank you, Mauricio, to Tatiana and Ramon to close us out. And th let me just say that that coming from you, Bill, I'm very humbled by 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 those comments. So thank you, and and hopefully I won't I won't let you down. Ramon, would you like to say something before I wrap it up? Uh, well, look, I think my key takeaway is uh, Mauricio's invitation for the private sector to join him in, in finding solutions to bring back prosperity to Latin America. I think working with the DFIs. Uh, we've been doing it for 15 years, but it's not so much in the Swiss DNA and it's not painless, I, but it can work extremely well. And, and, and I invite everyone really on, on this call, the Swiss firms to, to be in touch with, uh, with I, IFC or IDB or these development institutions. There's so many things we can do together and uh, for our own benefit. It, it, it's, uh, what should I call it? <laughs> enlightened self-interest it's not philanthropy so. okay. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, Ramon, you 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 said something there that's so important it's it's not painless and one of the things that we're trying to do here one of the legacies that i want to leave here is i want to make it as painless as possible you know at the end of the day this is a, a relationship it's an easy mutually beneficial relationship you're making money and we're helping have development impact and helping uh, uh, communities and vulnerable populations and others uh, throughout. It's a win-win. It should win, be win. easy. It should be painless. 
and it hasn't been because sometimes uh, uh, our institutions are a little bit bureaucratic, but we're changing that. And, uh, and if not, just uh, call me up and yank me in the ears because that's something that we need to do. So that's a great point. Thank you for raising that. Well, I'll call you up on the digital schools. I think we have something to show you. <laughs> great. I'm all in. Jana, I, I pass it to you. Wonderful. Well, in the name of our chamber, I want to thank our guest, Mauricio Claver Carone, for being with us today sharing the latest insights into the dense IDB agenda and giving us his dose of optimism while encouraging new partnerships on all levels of society to mitigate the ongoing crisis and further expand production. If any one of our viewers uh, still has questions that uh, we couldn't answer because we're way past the scheduled time, please, uh, you can uh, send them to me and I will make sure to pass them on to our guests um, team and office um, or to Mr. Rhodes and then you will receive your answer. A big thank you also to our moderator Bill Rhodes for preparing this program and challenging the dialogue with the usual rainbow of topics. I hope that all of you in the audience appreciated this program. We are thrilled that so many of you participated today. My thanks goes to the Swiss Chambers in Latin America, our partners for this webinar, for their cooperation throughout the year. I would also like to acknowledge once again the generous sponsoring today by Zürcher Kartonal Bank. For those who would like to view the recording of the webinar at a later date, it will be posted on our website under past events, as well as on our new YouTube channel. I look forward to seeing you soon again, hopefully latest for our virtual Latin America Day on May 27th. Save the date. In the meantime, be safe and all the best. Goodbye from Zurich. Thank you, Thank Tatiana, you. Bill, Mauricio. Thank Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Hmm.